be with you. And also with you. Will you please stand and join me in our call to worship? Uh, and by the way, it's an exciting Sunday because it's Palm Sunday, which means we have extra things to have fun with and celebrate God. So, on the chorus of the first hymn, I want to see some waving. All right? I know we're Presbyterian, but we can do it. We can do it, people. I promise. Friends, let us enter the city with God today and sing hosannas to our King. Let us turn our backs on the powers that grasp and control and open our hearts to the one riding on a donkey. Let us walk in solidarity with the abandoned and oppressed and follow the one who brings freedom and peace.
on this day of celebration and passion, we come joining the one and joining the crowd who sings Hosanna, but also remembering that it is the Hosannas that we want. But there is more to this day than just Hosannas. So let us come together and confess our resistance to the passion. Let us join together in our prayer of confession and Lenten renewal. Wise and wondrous God, every morning you bring us a new arrival. This being human is a guest house. Every day comes as an unexpected visitor, a joy, a depression, a meanness, or some momentary awareness. So we pray this day for the courage to welcome and entertain them all, these gifts from you, even if they are a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep the house empty of its furniture. Help us to treat each guest honorably. They just may be clearing us out for a new delight. Even the dark thought, the shame, and the malice. May we meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Help us to be grateful for whoever comes, for each has been sent as a guide from beyond, from you. Accomplish in us, O God, the work of your salvation, that we may show forth your glory in the world. By the cross and passion of our Savior, bring us with all your saints to the joy of Christ's resurrection. Amen. Find someone you don't know. Look around and wish them the peace of Christ. Peace of Christ be with you. Peace of Christ, Nancy. Thank you. Peace of Christ, Al. Peace of Christ, Jean. Peace of Christ, Angie. Thank you. Good. you have been to a parade before? Me. Yeah? Yeah? I think we have some other friends too if they wanted to come up and join us. Do we have other little people up there that want to come? Bring your palm. Oh! Do we have more of them? Okay. That's okay. All right. Come on up, guys. Come on, L. All right. So, what do they do at parades? Uh, what? 
have floats, yeah? It's kind of like a party in the streets, isn't it? Yeah. Do you get candy sometimes? Yeah. And, okay. And donuts? <laughs> oh, yes. Well, uh, this day we are celebrating a huge parade that they had for Jesus a long, long time ago when he was coming into Jerusalem. And they yelled, what word? Hmm. Probably, but what other word do you think? Oh, Hosanna. That's right. Can you stand up for me and wave and say Hosanna? Hosanna. Hosanna. That's right. Well, um, Mr. Brent has been working with some of you on a song, but it's a pretty simple song, so I think our other friends can stand here and learn it with us, don't you think? Okay. lead our parade this morning and you can parade out with Miss Nicole and head on up to Godly Play. We'll see you after worship. See you after worship. As we turn to God's word, let us pray. Oh God, some might say our world is filled with darkness. And yet on this day, we ask that through the reading and listening of your word, we might see light. We might know your light and we, we might be empowered to follow. In Christ's name, amen. Our first reading this morning comes to us from Isaiah 50, starting at verse 4 and going through verse 9. The Lord has given me the tongue of a teacher, so that I might know how to sustain the weary with a word. Morning by morning he awakens, wakens my ear to listen to those who are taught. The Lord has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backward. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. 
The Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Who will stand up together, or let us stand up together? Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me. Who will declare me guilty? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second lesson comes from the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, it's a long section, but we're going to do it antiphonally, Jesse and I. So I ask you to hear the familiar words of this story of the crucifixion as if for the very first time. Starting at verse 1. When morning came, all the chief priests and all the elders of the people conferred together against Jesus in order to bring about his death. They bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. When Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he repented and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. He said, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they said, what is that to us? See to it yourself. Throwing down the pieces of silver in the temple, he departed and he went and hanged himself. But the chief priests taking the pieces of silver said, it is not lawful to put them into the treasury since they are blood money. After conferring together, they used them to buy the potter's field as a place to bury foreigners. For this reason, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then, 
was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. And they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price of the one on whom a price had been set, on whom some of the people of Israel had set a price, and they gave them for the potter's field as the Lord commanded me. Now Jesus stood before the governor and the governor asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, you say so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many accusations they make against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner named, called Jesus Barabbas. So after they had gathered, Pilate said to them, whom do you want me to release for you, Jesus Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Messiah? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with this innocent man, for today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. The governor again said to them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, then what should I do with Jesus who is called the Messiah? And all of them said, let him be crucified. Then he asked, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took some water and he washed his hands before the crowd saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. Then the people as a whole answered, his blood be on us and on our children. So he released Barabbas for them, and after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped him and put on a scarlet robe on him, and after twisting some thorns into a crowd, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his hand, right hand, and they knelt before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spat on him. They took the reed and struck him on the head. After mocking him, they stripped him of his robe, and they put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they came upon a man from Cyrene named Simon. They compelled this man to carry his cross, and when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull, they offered him wine to drink, mixed with gall, but when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his clothes among themselves by casting lots. Then they sat down there and kept watch over him. Over his head, they put, char put the charge against him, which read, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Then two bandits were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads saying, you would destroy the temple and build it up in three days? Save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him, saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he wants to. For he said, I am God's son. The bandits who were crucified with him also taunted him in the same way. From noon on, Darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani? That is, 
My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, This man is calling for Elijah. At once, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. Then Jesus cried again with a loud voice and breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now, when the centurion and those who were with him who were keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place. They were terrified and said, Truly, this man was God's son. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts meet with the intention of your spirit for wholeness and for healing and for hope. Amen. We all know by now that today is Palm Sunday. But that's not the real name for this day in the church year. The real name for this day is called Palm Sunday. Passion Sunday. The palm part, you know. It is the praise and celebration of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, which we have just been doing. Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the day we want to celebrate with the children and their smiling faces. And we actually look forward to picking up little pieces of palm branches every year because as annoying as the cleanup might be, it is far less trouble and easier to fix than the muddy mess going on inside of us when we look closely and honestly at the passion. Because this act of coming into Jerusalem also began the passion the mess, the isolation, the loneliness, the arrest, the torture, and the excruciatingly painful execution of Jesus. The palm and the passion, the praise and the pain, the majesty and the mud begin today. The music that seems best to capture all of this has been dancing a dirge in my head all week long. It is from the movie Shrek of all places. These words are from Leonard Cohen's song, simply titled Alleluia. Two lines have stood out all week. I've seen your flag on the marble arch. Love is not a victory march, it's a cold and it's a broken alleluia. In this text, Jesus is asking us to go with him to Golgotha because there is something so very important about this suffering, this messiness. But we just don't want to go there. The texts leading up to today echo a similar melancholy about being forsaken. What does it mean to be forsaken? How do you forsake another? We get an idea as we look closely at these texts that view the last moments of Jesus' life. The sour wine that he refused mixed with drugs to help ease the pain. The taunting of the bandits and those who were standing around. As you heard in our text, Jesus screams in Aramaic, quoting Psalm 22, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
even those who don't consider themselves Christian, even for them this is a painful text, brimming full of all the brutality that we are each capable of feeding each other in heaping helping. But most of us just don't want to go there. We want to skip this part. Even in just our imaginations, being there with Jesus during the crucifixion, the sights, the smells, the sounds, it is just too messy, too powerful, too muddy. As children, this is exactly what we discovered growing up. On the street where I lived in Charlotte, North Carolina, there were five of us boys, pretty much the same age. We had a little club. Every spring during Easter, I would read the passion story to everyone else. What a sight we were. Lit in a neighbor's basement by only a candle, standing in a circle, and every one of us big, tough boys trying not to show the tears we were wiping away. We just don't want to go there, to Golgotha. So most of us jump straight from the first half of our celebration today and go straight to Easter morning, filled with even more sunshine and more celebration. We bypass Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, and anything that would threaten our illusion of happiness because we figure life is already hard enough. We've endured enough pain throughout the week with our normal schedules, thank you very much. And Madison Avenue continues to remind us that we're not thin enough or tall enough or smart enough or sophisticated enough or talented enough. We may get more of the same at work or even from family, and we certainly don't need to come here and be reminded of it once again. We want church to be joyful, not just at Easter, but all year long. I want my church to be a happy place, more than one of you has told me this week. We want to be filled with the joy of the Spirit. And then I also heard this. It seems to me that we are called to glorify God with our lives, and all that they want to do is come and bask in the glory themselves. The former causes us to change and completely transform our lives because it is centered in service to others. The latter is like putting a $500,000 hand-knotted Persian rug over a giant hole in the floor. We just don't want to think about the emptiness underneath. It is much easier to just cover it over. Of course, if we can't bask in the glory, we'll go to the other extreme and bask in the blood. Either way, we avoid paying attention to our own lives. All of you who have seen an original screening of the Passion of Christ know exactly what I mean. If you can get through the movie without shutting your eyes or getting sick, by the time it is over, you're completely exhausted from all the brutality. Walking out of the theater, you realize that you now know more than you ever wanted to know about Jesus' death. And walking a little bit further, your heart breaks because there's almost nothing in the movie to point you to the life that he led. Wasn't his life and his teachings, his example of honest and complete faithfulness to God, the real embodiment of love? Isn't his life the whole point? We tend to lose that in this text and are tempted to believe that his entire life was nothing more than a prelude for his death. And if that is true, my friends, then nothing changes. If Christ's life and teachings and example don't matter, then the powers of the Roman state, the religious hierarchy of the temple, and the will of the people who shouted for his crucifixion 2,000 years ago are still winning. If Christ's life doesn't matter, then the powers that today exert political and religious control still are keeping us in our place. 
If Christ's life doesn't matter, then we can keep arguing over whose church is this, shouting down or ignoring anything or anyone who gets in the way or of our need for a quick fix. Through all the mud and the messiness of our lives, Christ, Christ's life matters because our lives matter. It is the mud and the messiness that redeem us. You and I both know that this story is about us. It's about you and me. It is not just a 2,000-year-old story about characters far removed from us. These 54 verses in the Gospel of Matthew are about us. The story is all about the ways that we pretend to wash our own hands of responsibility and pretend that we have nothing to do with outcomes that keep us stuck in the mud going nowhere over and over again. This story is about the many ways that we deny, disown, and distance ourselves from life because we're too afraid of dying, not, realize, not realizing that we are bringing about exactly what we fear. This story is about the ways that we cast blame on each other as we go through life, avoiding the hard work of growing because we're busy killing anything that threatens our status quo. One of the ways that I begin writing each week is to go to the thesaurus. Isn't it interesting that there's no word in the thesaurus for thesaurus? It's a lot like a children's story that I have where one thing leads to another and to another and to another and often takes me on a very exciting journey. So I started with the word forsaken. Forsaken took me to abandoned. Abandoned took me to discarded. Discarded took me to useless. Useless took me to reject. Reject took me to refuse and to refuse. Refuse took me to rubbish. Rubbish took me to garbage. And garbage took me to Golgotha. Golgotha was the town dump. The Mass is not just something to endure and get through, my friends. The Mass is life. Most of us, probably all of us, believe that life happens once we get it together, once we get the job and the income we need, once we get the spouse we dream of, once we get the education that we've always wanted, the car, the boat, the place at the lake, retirement, once we get a real minister so that we can begin real ministry. Or perhaps we believe that happiness and joy can come only when we're Christian enough or giving enough or caring enough. Either way, we are defining life as beginning out there somewhere in the future as if happiness and real living are controlled by outside forces and circumstances over which we have no control. So I heard this interview on the radio with Thich Nhat Hanh. He is a Buddhist monk from Vietnam who has learned a thing or two about life. Among his many books and poetry, he has written a book entitled Living Buddha, Living Christ, paralleling the similarities of these two great religious leaders. His soft-spoken demeanor and gentleness belie the many Golgotha, Golgothas that he has endured during his lifetime. His presence, even over the radio, shows a beauty and a peace that can only be described as a flower. He spoke eloquently and succinctly. He said, without suffering, there is no way to know understanding and compassion. And that 
is the definition of the kingdom of God. The lotus flower, one of the most beautiful of all flowers, must grow only in the mud. And there it is. Life and all of its messiness and all of its smelliness and all of its ugliness and all of its meanness and all of its terror and all of its pain and in all of its passion is waiting for you. Lived by the one whose compassion continues to redeem us all. Maybe his death as gruesome and painful as it was, is nothing more than a prelude to life that by God's grace, we are just beginning to see blooming in the mud. We will now be receiving our offering this morning. Let us give out of generosity, out of our love, and out of the great gifts that God has given to us.
Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for your many blessings to us. We ask that you would accept these gifts that are given in your name. May they multiply. May they fill the world with your love as we serve in your name. It is through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, this is our time in our worship uh, where we come to pray and we share um, in the joys and the concerns of our community of faith and those around the world. Today we continue to pray for Roger Wadding um, as he um, continues to struggle with a terminal heart disease. Uh, we continue prayers for Joanne Swisher who has moved under hospice care at Birch Haven. So we pray for her in these final days. We also note the loss of one of our number, Tom Bias. A memorial service will be held for Tom on Saturday at 11 o'clock with the reception following in the great room. There also will be visitation from 4 until 8 o'clock on Friday evening um, at Kilpatrick Benke, right? But we ask for prayers for Anne and for their entire family. Um, and we mourn the loss of Tom. I invite you to share the joys and the concerns that you might have this day. Yeah. Yes. Uh, many of you know the story of uh, Owen Macbeth, who um, suffered a, a perinatal stroke um, in utero um, a number of months ago. Um, Owen has been diagnosed um, with a rare form of epilepsy. Um, and so we ask for lots of prayers for their family as Owen and Emily will be in seclusion for six weeks uh, while he undergoes a medication where his um, immune system will be, um, can be compromised. So it will be the two of them together um, and hoping that this treatment um, will um, help him um, in the days and months and years ahead. So I know Evan and Emily um, covet your prayers um, and we will keep you updated as uh, we hear and know more. So thanks for that reminder, Janet. Others? Yeah, Joanne. Uh, Joanne would like to give thanks for um, those who, uh, the military families and those who serve um, to keep us safe. And also she gives thanks this day um, for the youth of our country. Amen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Deb gives thanks this day for um, our children's choir and for Brent and the work it takes to <laughs> Get them all together. <laughs> <laughs> and Jenny, it's great to see you. Welcome back. Well, let us turn to God to, in prayer. Our glory, laud, and honor are yours, O God. You who are the source of all life and its gifts you who are present in all times and places. We worship you today, God, celebrating your goodness and care for our world and for our lives. We give you praise. And yet, even as we lift our palms, we know the road that you walk this week. We know the road will lead to death, for we too are on this journey with you. We are too aware of death these days, O oh God. And we know that anything short of the abundant life that you offer us is not life at all. We continue to be a country at war, in our schools, on the streets, and across the world. We continue to know people and children around the world and in our own city without enough food to eat or adequate education or housing. 
We continue to know friends who lose jobs, marriages, and loved ones. We know death, God, and we lift all these things and people who are faced with these struggles. We also lift the sick, the prisoners, refugees, the lonely, the unloved, the despised, and the misunderstood. Yet even in the midst of death and the cross, we know hope too. You have spared us hopelessness because of Christ. And even though there is death, love always overcomes it. So help us to know more of this love, to give witness to this love, and to become this love for others. Strengthen us to stand by Christ this week and always, and to accept the risk of the gospel as an element of our faithfulness to you. Confront each of us with our capacity to deny and to crucify. And as this week passes, speak to us through its events, reminding us of your constant love, surprising grace, and caring power. We pray all this in the strong name of the one who came, who came and gives love. And we pray the prayer that he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So today, my friends, begins Holy Week. A week where we cannot simply do business as usual. And we invite any who hunger to know more of God and God's love in the midst of the failures of our own lives, of our church, of our leadership, of this world, to join us on Thursday evening for dinner at 6 o'clock, potluck, bring something, and then for worship in the sanctuary at 7, as we share communion and remember love among us. Additionally, the sanctuary will be open on Friday from 12 noon until 5 for your own prayers and meditation. Easter Sunday begins actually on Saturday <laughs> at 4 o'clock, because worship in the pews is not for everyone. But on Saturday at 4, we'll be having a Holy Week festival, journeying through different rooms with Jesus as he moves through his last week. Families and the young at heart, we invite you to join us. And then worship at a sunrise service at 6.30 on Sunday, and then an Easter festival worship service at 9.30. So come, fully enter this week. If there was any time for you, for me, for the world, that we need to spend a little extra time entering into the quiet, remembering who we are, whose we are, and who God calls us to be, it is this one. Come this week and be filled with the amazing gift of God's love. Will you please stand and join me in our final hymn? <laughs>
out into the world in peace, armed with the power of God that can help you embrace life and all of its messiness so that you can bloom into the beautiful flower that God has made you to be. Amen.